On this episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show, we talk about different ways of monitoring workloads for different types of athletes. The Ask Mike Reynolds Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show. I'm here with my crew of physical therapy and strength and conditioning friends at Champion PT and Performance, Dewesh Podell, oh, Dewesh Podell, Lenny Macrina, Mike, Mike Scaduto, Dan Pope, Dave Tilly, Lisa Russell, just going top to bottom on the screen. Yeah. I'll, I'll reverse it next time, guys. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're here, uh, here answer, answering all your amazing questions um if you have questions head to micron.com click on that podcast link and we are here for you anything you guys want to talk about <laughs> pt fitness sports career let's do it um len let's uh let's regroup let's get uh let's get the students uh introduced here so we can get a great question we, we have some, a great question for this one, so I'm looking forward to this. Uh, we have three, three beautiful students. We have Brendan Gates from Duke University. We have uh, Jonathan Sandberg from Creighton University. And the cardboard cutout of Katie Stone is still in the background. Uh, Katie from UNLV running. Oh, it, 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 it moved. She moved. There we go. Katie is alive. It's Katie Stone from UNLV. She hasn't moved in over a week. That's amazing. <laughs> She's been standing there for a week. <laughs> That's crazy. Gates, what do we got? All right, we got Mandy in Ohio. So in school, we talked about workload measurement and monitoring for running and lifting. How do you all uh, like to measure workload in other sports, such as soccer, gymnastics, or do you find that monitoring an athlete's response to exercise is sufficient? I like it. Good. Wait, so are we? So is soccer a sport? Do we define that as a just kidding? Jonathan's a big soccer player. Mm. We like doing that. I love soccer people. Just I like all athletes. Just wanted to throw that out there. But uh, good question. But yeah, you know what? That's a I, 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 good question, Mandy. Because I think I actually think the easiest workload monitoring is probably in, like you said, lifting, right? So in fitness athletes, right? Because man, you you have everything. You have every objective data point. You have sets, you have reps, you have load. You, I mean, you could even have speed, even your rest. I mean, you put your whole trading load together. Like it is so easy to monitor work. Or I should say so easy. It's complicated, right? But it's it's a little bit uh, more straightforward to measure it in, in workload. And I, I guess I'll introduce it from a baseball standpoint and then I'd kind of hear what some other people I know Dave has put a considerable amount of gymnastics work into this here, but in baseball, when we start talking about, let's say like pitching injuries or hitting injuries, the first thing we do is take a step back and try to like define a little bit. So let's say pitching, right. In pitching, we can manipulate a lot of variables. Again, there's repetitions, but if I just lob the ball versus I throw the ball as high as I can, is that the same workload metric? Right. So you have to like kind of come up with definitions based on that. So what we did in baseball is we, we took what we knew scientifically of stress. So torque essentially is what we use the biomechanical term, like from biomechanical studies, we took torque and what's the torque difference in, let's say the elbow on the Tommy John ligament been playing light catch or stretching out long toss or throwing weighted balls or doing a bullpen or pitching in a game. Right. We actually have enough science now and biomechanical data now that we know that and then we can assign like different workload grades so look 20 years ago we tried this which is like innings pitched right and pitches per game but again like if you throw a change up or a fastball does that matter right there's so many different metrics that we can kind of put into this but i think the big thing what you do is when you're starting to get into your sport is you start to say like what is the what is the unit of work that matters to your sport so in weightlifting it's probably load and like 
total reps or something like that. In, in baseball, it's intensity and throws, right? That sort of thing. So Dave, from there, why don't you kick it off? Because you started this almost from scratch in a sport of gymnastics that is super complex, right? Cause you don't even, you, you guys aren't even doing the same thing, right? Yeah. Different people to have different events that they do that are completely different stress. How did you first go about this? Because I feel like if you can do it in gymnastics, we can do it in almost anything else. Yeah. This was uh, the exact reason why I took Tim's course in New York a couple of years ago. And then kind of we had follow up stuff is I, I was definitely understanding the concepts, but I was really not seeing how it applies to gymnastics. And so uh, Tim was super helpful. And we actually had a study that was going uh, before COVID kind of shut it down on like how to, it's like niche sports, right? They're like weird kind of ominous. They're not like you can't objectively look at, you know, pitches or, you know, things like that with speed. So the ways that we do this with sports that are more mixed modality, as Tim would say, is, is like you're looking at the different like um, zones of intensity and trying to find a workload measurement behind that. So with soccer and with sprinting, something that Tim showed us in the course is they, they monitor the time spent in different speeds of running, right? So like just a, you know, running 40 yards at a very jog or a low level jog versus sprinting 40 yards is very different stress on your hamstrings. And so they were starting to do that in other sports where they would wear GPS accelerometers and also heart rate monitors. And they would measure the zones of intensity, how long you're operating in that kind of uh, high workload or low workload. And that was very successful. And so for other sports too, like gymnastics or wrestling, or, you know, I think water polo, uh, Tim was working into what you have to do is you have to find a very similar way to, to gauge that metric. So that's what we did in gymnastics is we took the variables we have to work with our time, right? The amount of time spent on a specific uh, event in practice. And then we use an internal workload of, of RPE for just that event. So we take the time we multiply it by the, the event RPE. So how hard was just bars? How hard was just floor? And then we multiply it by a weighting factor, which is what Tim suggested we do. So in other sports too, it's like you have, you know, a one intensity, like basic drills, basic warmups. You're not really too, too hardcore, but then two, three, four, four is like you're competing in a game, you're competing in a match, you're competing in a, in a gymnastic competition. It's pretty much the highest, um, you know, physical workload, but also, uh, you know, stress workload in terms of like, you know, mental stress and focus and stuff. So that's what we did in gymnastics is we multiply time, a weighting factor and a RPE of the athlete. A coach give the workload, uh, um, amplifier or the that weighting and you multiply those together and get a session load so that's what we've been doing now and it was really successful our pilot study with two um, big division one schools was really really promising and it didn't work out but i think that's where a lot of like wrestling and water polo should go is zones of intensity and weighting factors for how hard that training session like the skills are in that training session so to me i think what you did was you did a great job defining like overall uh energy system type stuff and overall like fatigue levels right <laughs> What about something specific? What, what about, um, and I'm not super up on gymnastics, although I'm more than I ever have been, thanks to Dave's uh, wisdom next to me all day. But um, let's say like a spondy in the back, yep. right? And let's say we want to build workload monitoring specific to somebody with stress on the back, for example. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you do that? Or do you even do that? Or do you just do just overall exertion? Like, is there a certain event where like, look, we're getting a ton of back bend. So, you know, there's more things like how, how do you grade that specificity? Yeah, this is honestly the work that I took from you guys in the baseball world is replicating return to sport programs for workloads that way. So we measure the three variables in gymnastics are the actual uh, number of skills, right? The force per skill. So doing a very basic, you know, back handspring is very different than like a double back or a full in or a very, very high level release skill. So we have that and force per skill. And then we have the surface that they're on to the, the softer foam pits, the tumble track, Lenny's favorite, the hard floor all have very different forces per impact. So we measure those three variables. And then what we're doing now and some of the more high-end complicated stuff is we're doing tibial um, accelerometers and g-force uh, load so we put a tibial strap on someone and it measures bone force at in fact impact so we know the lower extremity impact is the worst in gymnastics it's 15 20 times body weight per per rep so we put g-forces on that and then measure that load and then we have you know you can count the number of back bends and how hard they're doing it and stuff like that so there are ways to do it but it's just it's just a lot of work Awesome. All right. Lisa, from a rowing perspective, I think this is a different sport now than what we've talked about previously. It is, it is a, I don't want to say long distance like type thing, but it is, it's like a, it's like a marathon rowing, biking sorts of things where you're doing one thing repetitively over and over again, which you could argue maybe your intensity level is fairly it isn't that it fluctuates as much. It's just for a longer duration of time. How do you do more of this endurance based sport? So, yeah, I mean, and for, I feel like it depends on what level of competitor you're talking about. Right. But um, for 
endurance based, like highly competitive rowers, honestly, part of the challenge is the volume or the amount of time someone is rowing is incredibly high and their intensity is typically also pretty high. Um, so, you know, the close to race pace kinds of work that they're mixing in with insane amounts of volume is, is they're really highly competitive rowers are always right on that line of injury for the most part, you know, and one little piece falls apart in their, in their balance. So that's, you know, and that's tends to be when they come and see me, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it sounds like for workload, you have distance and intensity, which I, I mean, really pretty much up here. Um, right, I was going to say that with intensity, nobody's uh, rowing slowly. Right. But now I'm not like well, a rower, I mean, but like, <laughs> yes no. yeah, I mean, you, still, you need those base miles. Right. But um, the nice thing in rowing is that uh, there are so many technologies out there to help you monitor workload. Um, whether uh, most rowers wear heart rate monitor straps to at least track their workout in that way so that they can see what zones they're in at various points Um and then using uh, systems like training peaks or those kinds of things that give you a training stress score for your workout so that you're able to track. And it, the training peak system is awesome. It, it like graphs everything so that you can see like one week to the next, one month to the next, like all those kinds of things to see what your training volumes do to see if you're um, increasing too quickly or, you know, whatever it kind of, it, it helps you, if you use it correctly, it helps you monitor all of those things. Um, and you know, but then that's where there's a lot of other factors other than just your personal like body workload because it's an outdoor sport, you know, it like temperature, wind, like all those <laughs> kinds of things matter, yeah. like the heaviness C currents. of water, like, <laughs> you know, the, the current or the like, temperature of the water and how heavy it is, you know, and that's where we're starting to talk with a lot of our athletes about like the return to water in March. And, you know, that's where it's like, okay, if you've been doing you know, 70 minutes twice a day on the erg, you can't just throw that onto the water because it's different factors. And you're, and that's where like that workload management skill comes in hugely in coaches because yeah. you're, you're changing that environment and you can't just plop the same like athlete workload, you know, minutes right. of, of work over onto the water when there's so many other factors that all of a sudden come into play. Um, so it is, it's something that rowing is, learning you know and and some honestly some like countries are better at it than others um and and then you know it depends it depends on the level uh but at the high level like you know a, a lot of coaches are finally using those tools of training peaks and different things and using athlete readiness skills in the morning so that you know they at least are staying in con like keeping it in context of like how their athletes are handling their training plans and not just blanket giving everyone the same number of minutes and the same amount of intensity. Um, All right. So, so for workload monitoring, what I'm hearing from this in an endurance based sport too, is like yeah. you, obviously you have distance, you, you have intensity, right? I mean, what about pace? Like, so say you don't have access to a heart rate monitor and you're using yeah. somebody, can you manipulate pace? Where you, you know, you know yeah. what I mean? And like, and you have different right. levels of pace. Um, so, so I, that's pretty cool. And I'm, I'm sure much of what Lisa said would probably carry over quite well to biking and endurance and yeah, stuff I'd like say that. Running and biking, it's all very similar. You know, any, yeah. any is just like super, endurance sports like you know right. heart monitoring comes in pretty big but then and you know amount of impacts when you're in terms of running or you know whatever it it, it translates pretty well i would say across yeah all the uh, mike for for golf because uh, golf's an interesting sport too because um you know you usually have a specific injury so say it's like your elbow your back your knee whatever it may be right and we want to manipulate stress on a certain thing right i don't think anyone's going to monitor heart rate during golf we'd be utterly disappointed with what we <laughs> with what with what we come up with same with baseball by the way baseball is quite quite sedentary you, you you have to sprint 90 feet once every 45 minutes right like that's not it's 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 very low pacing in there but for for golf like how how do you monitor workload progressions of like stress on a body part like because there's so many variables in golf you have so many different like shots and things like that what do you do in golf yeah absolutely i think there's a, a you know as with any other sport there's a bunch of factors um a big one being with with amateur golfers what we tend to see is their chronic workload is is fairly low and then they'll spike they'll spike up quite abruptly you know when the weather gets nice 
Um, so we tend to see that's when injuries pop up in that population. They just go from taking zero swings to going and hitting 250 golf balls. Um, and the other thing is, you know, the equipment that they're using and the surface that they're hitting off of, you know, in practice, we tend to hit off of rubber mats, which may have more of an impact force through the shaft, um, you know, through the tissues of the forearm uh, and even the shoulder. Um, that can lead to some issues as well. And then from an intensity perspective, obviously swing speed is a uh, you know, good way to measure the intensity of the swing, but also the length of the shaft is different for each club, um, which will influence the amount of club head speed that you're able to generate. Uh, but a longer shaft theoretically may put more stress on you know, your tissue and then a shorter, a shorter shaft, where you, which we would find in a wedge or a shorter iron, um, theoretically could put more or sorry, put a little less stress on certain areas of your body. Um, but the other factor I think that is important in, in monitoring workloads, say we're coming back from a low back injury is the amount of, uh, is the posture that you're assuming, you know, with each of these swings. So with a shorter shaft, we may, a uh, shorter shafted club, like a lower iron, we may actually be in a little bit more of a hip hinge, a little bit more bent over as opposed to a driver. So again, there's, there's a bunch of factors, um, that we look at, I think from a, from a broad overview um, spectrum, number of swings is, is a good way to look at it, but I think you have to go a little bit deeper when you're coming back from some kind of injury. I, that's a, it's a great way of saying it too. I mean, the, the very least, if this is all you have is swing count, it's better than nothing, right? I mean, that's helpful. It's better than nothing. But more importantly, I think what it comes down to is that there's different stresses on so many different things. So it's, it's it, you know, I mean, it, it, you can change your club length. You can change your type of swing. You have to understand that. And just, it, and even if you make up numbers, if you say like a max effort drive is a 10, Right. And then or you start thinking based on that. Okay. Then what is like a long iron? Okay. Maybe that's like an eight, right? What's a mid iron. What's a, what's a chip, right? Is a chip a it's one a or a two, right? What's a putt, right? I mean, for me, sometimes it's usually so far away. I mean, that could be a three, four, right? I get a lot it's of a rotation. I get a lot of rotation with my putt, but you see, you see a little difference here. So, so uh, look, I, I good episode. We could keep going forever on this. I think what we saw was a bunch of different ways to monitor workload. What you need to do is take your act activity and figure out what is the unit of stress that you want to measure, that you want to quantify, you want to monitor. And I think that's, that's the important part. So we talked about endurance based things where it's, 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 it's more like pace and mileage and time and heart rate. Obviously we talked about field sports where heart rate is awesome. And then how heart rate would be terrible in golf and baseball and stuff like that. Right. We talked about how like in baseball, there's different, distances and intensities same with golf with different swings you got to kind of put all that together based on your activity there's a million ways to do it but i i think that's a good start for you mandy that you can kind of take it from there and kind of think about what's the specific activity that you're trying to monitor make sense so great question thanks so much good episode there i thought on on workload monitoring uh great stuff uh if you have another question head to micron.com click on that podcast link and be sure to subscribe itunes spotify Thanks so much. See you guys on the next episode.